everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this panel. Uh, my name is Genevieve Margaret. I'm a campaign director with Countersyn. Um, briefly, Countersyn, we exist as an organization to, to go beyond the converted. We're trying to reach the, the movable middle, the silent majority of people uh, who, um, probably like you and me in this room, actually, people who care about the climate, care about climate action, but aren't necessarily seeing it happening all around them. Um, and so we try to run campaigns through sport, through football, all with a view to reaching people um, through the thing in their lives that they love, with messages that resonate, and through messengers like footballers, who they probably are going to listen to more than, say, the climate scientists or even the leaders, all with a view to getting people to, to show up and maybe take action or do something symbolic. And in doing that, we believe that you um, eventually that, that type of action shows up at a, at a systemic level. Uh, perhaps when politicians, leaders, business leaders really take notice. They're taking notice of that quiet majority of people in the middle. And so we run campaigns to do that. Green Football Weekends in the UK, Earth FC, uh, and uh, hopefully one in the US as well. But enough about me. We are here today to talk about greening the game, sports and sustainability initiatives taking centre stage. And I'm joined by this wonderful panel. We have uh, Rishi, Director of Impact at Liverpool FC. We have Rafa. General Manager at Real Betis Foundation, Gaia from uh, Head of Sustainability for the European Club Association, and Monica, uh, who is the Football Technical Director at the Saudi Arabia Football Federation. So welcome and thank you. I'd really like to start actually by asking you about the title of this, uh, this, of this um, event, Greening the Game, Sports Sustainability Initiatives. Are they taking centre stage? Do we think that actually we are in a position now where sustainability of all types is central to the, to the football industry, central to how we're conducting business every day? My personal sense is that we're moving that way, but actually it's certainly not centre stage yet. We're sort of still knocking on the door. <laughs> um, I'd love to open that question up to the panel. Gaia, perhaps I can come to you. Um, well... Definitely, since I joined ECA, you know, one year and a half almost ago, um, the main questions from clubs are relating to the environmental topic. Clubs have quite a long history in addressing social sustainability because it's quite normal for clubs to have a strong connection with the local community. So um, most of the clubs will always have had some kind of community projects or charity projects. But the environmental part is a little bit new. Um, for clubs that own stadium, it became quite key during COVID time and, and, and um, due also to the um, block of Russian gas. Of course, energy prices went up, so energy provision became a cost uh, mm -hmm. for many clubs. And some started looking into it because of it. Regulation is coming as well, so clubs are realizing that they need to start measuring their environmental impact to start with and then probably do something to prevent and manage it. So there is huge attention growing. I would say there are not many professionals out there that are used to work in, in sports and, and sustainability. So there is a little bit of difficulty need to find the right support in the market, especially in certain countries. But it's definitely a, a rising topic. And uh, we did the survey last year because at ECA we basically design services for our members. Both Liverpool and, and Betis are our members. And we asked, so which areas of sustainability you think you're already quite good at and where you need more support? And the, the clear answer was, well, so shall we kind of manage already? All the environmental part, be it waste management, be it climate change, be it infrastructure sustainability, would definitely help. So, so it's getting there, maybe. <laughs> well, I, I fully agree with Gaia. It's something that I think it's uh, it's a trend uh, at the moment. I, I really believe it's it's happening in every in every industry. Our case, we 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 are believers in that in that uh, topic, and we really think we have something to say, something to do. Uh, ability in general, but uh, through forever green in, in, in environmental sustainability in particular. Uh, we, we, as Gaia said, uh, the regulation framework is uh, pushing uh, every kind of organization, including football, of course, to, to get into the, into the train, into the mood, and uh, our 
feeling uh, is that uh, it's, it's, what is happening, it's a huge opportunity for, for, for everyone in football to, to learn, to increase their engagement with society, with the problems of the people, with the problems of the world, which is also really important, uh, thinking globally. Uh, and, but still, it is true that uh, there is uh, a lot of work to do, still a lot of work to do. So we cannot relax. Uh, we, we need to keep on pushing, keep on working. And I think the, the flow is really positive. I think I think that uh, uh, we have a very good scenario to to keep on working on that uh, and ability and especially in environment. I think. Brilliant, Rishi. Do you feel the same? Absolutely. I think if, for us, from a Liverpool Football Club perspective, we've really embraced sustainability as a business objective for us. It's in our strategies. It's in our frameworks. It's in our performance objectives. And actually, now speaking to colleagues and counterparts some other football clubs, not just in the Premier League, but across Europe, Rafa included. Everyone is, is on their own journey, and it's been brilliant to see. That journey's different, and that's actually even better to see, because you want that. You don't want a template which is just picked up and dropped off in different organizations, because that's hard. Um, we've done a really good job from a Premier League perspective to, to work on a joint commitment where it works for us, it works for teams that have just been promoted, but actually sustainability now is very much part and, part, part and parcel of every conversation that we're having. Um, when we are making key business decisions, sustainability is part of that decision-making process. We recognize, obviously, we've got commercial obligations, we've got an increase in gains, et cetera, and it's ha that's happening, we know that, but actually it makes this job and our jobs even more important. Brilliant. And then that's the European perspective, Monica, and South Africa. Uh, South Africa. Well, I, I think Saudi it's Arabia. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very complex topic, and, and, and I believe we have a long way to go, and... Um, I think uh, we are facing really severe problems uh, all over the world, not only um, in Saudi Arabia, where I have been. It's, it's also just Vienna. I think we're flooded. I'm sure you heard this. The eastern part of Europe, uh, people had to die. So, so things are really happening. And uh, I believe uh, we have to take care of the rising temperature, which is coming up. The, of course, the CO2 emission. I think uh, if we not get now involved or making action, I think our sport, football, where I have been now over 54 years, is really in danger. So I believe that is very important. And in one hand, we have the commercialized football industry getting more and more profit. On the other hand, we have to do something to change that, you know? So I, I'm, I'm a coach, so of course, and technical director, I'm on the field. Uh, but I believe we all have to take responsibility now, all of us, and, and we have to really look in the future how this is going to happen. And I'm very happy to hear UEFA, FIFA, or some other governing bodies are taking care now. When you want to host the World Cup, it's not just you get the bit and you have certain criteria fulfilled. I think this topic is a very, very top agenda, which I believe can change in the future many things. We have to consider also the United Nations. I know these uh, program, the development, sustainable development goals. I've been working in many, many different uh, countries where we implement this program and the young age. And that I believe we have to catch the young ones, the 9, 10, 11, 12 year old to educate them what is going to happen in their future. Yeah, so I believe that is the target group. And so I hope uh, we have to take care of that. Yeah. So it sounds like we're saying, maybe not quite at the center, but certainly in the room now, and we're pushing ever forward, which is yeah, <laughs> in the right direction. Richard, I'd love to come back to you, because at, at Liverpool FC, you've got the red way. I'd love to really hear some of the details about the initiatives you've actually sort of implemented there. What's worked, what hasn't? Yeah, of course. So the red way is our overarching ESG program. Um, it's our commitment to build a better future for our people, our planet, and our community. It's a... It's a model that works really well for us. It's fully holistic. When we talk about sustainability, we talk about the three different pillars. It allows us to level up messaging around diversity at certain moments of the year, allows us to talk about the planet at certain moments of the year, allows us to talk about our communities. Um, and it has been really successful for us. It was born in 2021. It was a culmination of multiple programs, some of which exist, some of which don't. Now, and that ranges from Red Together, which is our, it still exists, is our diversity inclusion identity, 
the Work of LSE Foundation, which is continuing to grow strength to strength. But then some really early initiatives used to have an initiative called Reds Going Green. It was essentially like a, a really little sticker next to a light switch when you left the room. It was like, Reds Going Green, don't switch the light off. And that was what like, environmental sustainability was for us. But since we really brought all that together, created the Red Way as, like, uh, as an umbrella or a North Star, however you want to put it, it's allowed us to sort of create that sense of purpose. That's how we do it. And we are seeing the results of that. So last World Earth Day, so early this year, we launched our Red Way season report for the previous season. And we were able to demonstrate 3% in our reduction on our baseline, 29% reduction on the previous season, 100% diversion from landfill. So we've got these really strong numbers that continue to come out. Um, I suppose one of the real impactful pieces of work that we've been able to do is around what people might think quite is basic, but around um, recycling rates at the stadium. Um, so we started off in sort of 2020 slash 2021 of um, recycling rates of around sort of 20 to 25 percent. And this is really simple. It sounds really simple, but it's not. It's around putting the plastic bottles that we do have that we need to have in the stadium because of the serving times and the density of people that are into the right bins. Um, we've now been able, over the past three years, able to raise that to 90%. And that has really been like a fan behavioral journey. It's been engaging with supporters. And it's not as simple as just, right, as a bin. You know, all know what to do, because it's not that simple. Like, we've all been to, obviously, everyone in this room has been, I'm sure, has been to a football match. We've been to music festivals. It just becomes like, a, as soon as one person puts it on the floor, that sort of gives everyone the green light to go, done. And we did used to see that. So it really pleases us that what we've been able to do in terms of the journey that we've been on. But the lessons that we've had to learn along the way is what makes us the most proud in the way, as well as the fan engagement piece. So really simple one. When we launched the bins, we had like a graphic of a cup. And it was a really generic, sort of like a, a word art type of style, really basic. And then we got all the cups and the contamination levels really high. So we got, okay, we need to go back to the drawing board. And we've constantly learned on the journey around that. But what's been really good is that we've now been able to use plastic from Anfield, so plastic waste from Anfield, to create product. So we've now got a really strong circularity story. After and now, at the moment, working with an external company who are using that plastic to make like shop fittings, to make boardings for community centers, to make football dugouts, goals, nets, etc. So it's really good. So we're starting to see the, the waste and where it comes from Anfield go to a really good place. And from, from a fan perspective, they're understanding and seeing the story that we can tell. We haven't officially announced it yet, but we've, um, over the past three year period, we've recycled a million bottles Brilliant. in Anfield, <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah. And you know what? In an ideal world, you wouldn't have a million bottles. We'd have zero, but at the same time as recycling, we're also on a reduction program as well, looking at how we serve people, mainly beer, um, how we serve them beer, water, et cetera, what taps can be put in place, what initiatives can be put in place. But as has been mentioned earlier, our stadium is, a, is an older one. We've got two new stands in there, which one is six months old, one is about 10 years old. The infrastructure there is really strong and the space allows that, but then you've got two older parts of the stadium where even like putting beer lines in just wouldn't work. You physically don't have the space to be able to do that. So the bottle is a solution. But for us, it's okay. That is a solution. How do we then solve the problem of having X amount of plastic bottles? But you know what? I would say that the data that we're able to give, just to finish off, the data that we were able to show allows us to show the impact of the red way. It helps internally when we talk to our people, when we say your behaviors, what we're asking you to do, actually to think differently, be a different type of colleague, make different decisions. This is the impact that it's having. And it's very much the same for supporters as well. And it's giving you a new communication channel in some ways, right? This data, yeah, okay, it's about recycling. This is not the topic all fans come to yeah. Liverpool to hear about, but you're able to actually internally and externally presumably find new ways to talk about where this waste has gone, how it's being reused, how it's being brought back into the... Absolutely, and you know what? People are interested because it's football, and we all know we're in this room because we're, most of us, are, if not all of us, are football fans, and we know that we can tell a story. And that's one thing as a club we're, we're very good at, is being able to tell a story about football and about people. Um, so actually, when we talk about the fact that our pitch is fully recyclable, like, people are like, how does that even work? And then we tell the story, we're like, that's fascinating. And then the next time they go to Anfield, you know that people are then talking to whoever they go to the game with and saying, did you know this? And we're constantly, the, the big thing for us is just constantly having that story time, that constant drumbeat of this is what we're doing, this is why it's really important. And then when we're asking supporters or we're asking our stakeholders to be with us on that journey it is very much a side-by-side -side journey rather than saying you must do this. It's something that we're doing together. Brilliant. And Gaia, you're working with uh, clubs like Liverpool, but clubs all over Europe to support them. And there's new EU regulations coming down the track. How do you think that's going to impact clubs positively, negatively? You know, how is it going to change things? Conversations around sponsorship, for example. Where do you think it's going to go? 
well, my, my personal opinion is that it's going to be a positive impact in the sense that, of course, when, when regulation comes, you have to do it. So I've been working in sustainability for many years, and when I started, it was all about the business case. Sustainability is something that will actually help your business grow because it's a reputational effect, you will attract talent, and you will have cost efficiency and blah, blah, blah. We tried a soft approach, let's say, for many years. Some clubs adopted it, some companies adopted it, but uh, definitely not enough to make the difference. So we unfortunately, and I say unfortunately because it would have been nice to manage to do it with just the business case, ended up in regulation has to step in and say, guys, this is not enough. You now have to really take into account your social and environmental impacts um, report on it and show that you are embedding it in a sense of risk assessment in terms of what the impacts you are causing on social and environment are going to affect your business, the revenue streams. And this is an exercise that the European Union is calling all the companies in Europe to do. Of course, clubs are companies, so as any other company will be subject to Clubs that are outside European Union will not strictly be obliged to do it. But of course, if it becomes the benchmark of EU clubs, also Liverpool will probably have to kind of adapt to it. And on top of this, um, we see also UEFA has introduced licensing sustainability requirements, which means that to get the license to compete in European competitions, club competition like Champions League, Europa League, Conference League, which for clubs, let's be honest, means survival <laughs> in most cases. Um, you need to get the UEFA license. And to get the UEFA license, you have to prove that you satisfy financial requirements, but now also sustainability requirements, which are basically have a name sustainability manager and have a sustainability strategy. At the very least, covers um, child childhood protection, that protects anti-discrimination, anti-racism, um, and accessibility as well as environmental protection. So it's mandatory for UEFA to submit a um, strategy that covers this, this aspect to get the UEFA license. So all combined, you know, I'm in a nice position because I'm not imposing anything to clubs. So I'm the good one. I can tell you, <laughs> look, the European <laughs> Union is telling you to do this. UEFA is telling you to do this. Some leagues are imposing sustainability requirements as well. DFL, for instance, um, put very uh, demanding, uh, our, our German friends know very well about it, um, to get the license to compete in Bundesliga, both Bundesliga <coughs> 1 and 2. We are talking about 117 KPIs of information on their environmental impact they have to fill. So um, there is a huge growing demand of information to start with, and on strategy and, um, uh, let's say, proof that you are addressing it at the business level, at the managerial level, at the organizational level. And so what we try to do is to provide some support to clubs how to do it. I'm the good friend that helps clubs comply with the different types of regulation. You know, it's not my fault. I'm, I'm just... Uh, but I think that's the only way to... to to make clubs more accountable for it. And then we have the good ones that started doing a while ago mm -hmm. because it was the right thing that luckily now are the best practices. And as you see, they are invited everywhere because there aren't many actually yeah. that, that did it uh, for so long in such a consistent way. Yeah. So Rafa, one of the good ones on the good, <laughs> 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 on the good list. I'd love, so we've heard about operationally, there's things that are going to be going on in the background, some, let's face it, quite boring things, but very important things. But I'd love to hear from you as well about how you actually engage the fans. Mm -hmm. How are you bringing the fans on this journey? Because clubs are nothing without their fans as well, right? And as we've heard from Rishi, that this is, this is a way that we can engage fans. But what have you found that's working and not working to actually make this sort of... Well, uh, we, we have four years of experience with these interactions, thanks to Forever Green Platform uh, and all, all the activities we have performed, more than 150 during these four years. 
And some of them, uh, many of them, in fact, are involving the fans and, and trying at least to, to, to reach them in the, and to involve them in the, in the movement. And we have uh, certain lessons learned from that. Uh, for us, uh, we, we, have, we are very lucky and we have a very nice scenario as well with our fans because for a Betis fan, the, the way we live uh, our club is also beyond football. We really believe that uh, it's a way of living as well. It's a way of uh, enjoying life and even caring of, of others. The, maybe this is because of uh, our history as well. We, we have a slogan which is uh, Viva el Betis, man que pierda. It's uh, come on Betis even if you lose. That makes us to have this sense of empathy uh, with the problems of the people, I think, because we, the Viva el Betis Man Que Pierda means that all our fans were supporting Betis even in their bad moments, when we ha were in the third division. Uh, and the stadium was, was uh, crowded every, every Sunday. So that makes us feel that we need to, to do something uh, in return for those who have been always behind, being loyal, being supporting. And that connection with community is part of, of the DNA of, of, of Real Betis. We, we really want to, to believe that. In fact, it's in the central of the strategy of the club. It's one of the lines of the, of the strategic plan of the club. And uh, the fans uh, are willing to, to receive that kind of content, that, that kind of, of uh, actions, because for them, it makes sense. Okay, we, we are in this family. It makes sense that the club and the foundation of the club does this, this kind of thing. But at the same time, it is true that it's a very difficult message. So um, the social message uh, of uh, sustainability actions regarding community and regarding our social projects is much more easier. But uh, environmental uh, content and, and messages are so new that uh, for the fans, it uh, was difficult to understand. At some point at the beginning, the first year, so many of them uh, thought that uh, Forever Green was a sponsor. <laughs> because it was in the in the shirt, so mm, it, it is true that it was confusing uh, at some point. But uh, the foundation, the club, and and we are doing a great effort in terms of communication, in terms of dissemination, also with a very strong connection with marketing. It's it's super mainstream for Evergreen. It involves every area in the club, but for this purpose to join the people, to join the fans to the movement, we need to, to send a, an attractive message. We cannot, it's very difficult to send a technical message to the, to the fans. They, they go to the stadium and they want to, to hear uh, exciting things, uh, something that makes them uh, smile and, and enjoy. And this is why football is so an amazing tool because it, uh, I always say it reached uh, every corner in the world, but also reached the heart of the people. So uh, it's a huge uh, uh, tool to, to, to mobilize, to make the people think. And this is why we are so determined to, to, to keep on working on that. It's, it's a very little by little process, drop after drop. Uh, and finally, for example, I was talking with a, with a, with a colleague uh, uh, outside and the other day to present the signing of a n new player, we show uh, some older women chatting in front of their house and even them with 75, 80 years, they were saying forever green, like uh, switch off the, the lights or switch <laughs> off the air conditioning, forever green. So, that culture, I think it's uh, a very, very good channel to, to, to reach uh, our fans. And for sure, our main goal as uh, Betis workers is to make them happy. In this case, we need to make them happy and proud uh, of what we are doing in their name and representing all of them. 
beautifully put. And briefly, Rishi, would you, does that resonate? Do you think the Liverpool fan is similar? Or do you think more cynical? Or <laughs> No, I'd say the Liverpool fan is very similar. Um, I always say that there is, as a football club, I'd say there's probably a higher expectation level when it comes to Liverpool. And you can see that two ways. You can either see it as a burden or you can see it as a opportunity. Um, and we very much see it as the latter. It is an opportunity. We're a club of many firsts. We're the first club to be involved in the UK Pride March. First sports team in the UK to have its players take the knee. Player led decision. Just about less than six months ago, we had 3,000 people come to Anfield um, to break fast in what was the biggest fast-breaking event in the football stadium ever. And it's amazing, and it makes me incredibly proud to sort of represent the football club, but also from our fans, like, that's, that's the values of Liverpool Football Club and what's expected. Um, a similar example, we had a game, it was actually our World Earth Day game um, in April, and play stopped, and one of our players, Ibrahim Kanate, and a Sheffield United player, both went off the pitch. And it wasn't communicated, people didn't really know what was happening. And then people realized they were actually breaking the fast mid-game, and the whole ground just boarded them. No, no coordination, no plan. And I'm sad there, like, I think about it, I've got, you can't see, but I've got goosebumps thinking that this is really, really special, because this is everything that we're about. Um, so for us, that's very much an opportunity. We see that through the work that we do for the Redway, particularly through the work of the foundation, which is targets to engage with 150,000 young people um, by the end of next season. And, the work that they do is just amazing. So from a community perspective, a purpose perspective, support and engagement, we know that if we get the tone right, if we get the mission right, if we actually take people with us as part of the conversation and say, we're doing this, come on this journey with us, we know we'll lead to success. Brilliant. And Monica, I'd love to come to you because you're working in the, the women's game and have been for many, many years. And how do you think women's football can uniquely contribute to this movement to sort of bringing sustainability into sport? Yeah, I think women football has been growing. Everybody knows that tremendously in the last, uh, well, couple of years, and it's getting more and more serious. And, and I think we have good voices, especially female voices, like Megan Rapinio. She addresses the concern about uh, gender equality, about diversity, about um, maybe not so much in the greener side, but, but she has uh, a lot of... Uh, strengths, you know, and voices to make these changes in the world. And, and I also believe, as I'm a woman, that we have a lot of stamina, a lot of endurance to, to address our concern. And uh, maybe, I'm not sure if I'm right, but this is also my opinion, that um, we're not looking so much as the profit. We, we are serious. We are want to tell the message. And uh, so I believe women are part of the society. We are 50%, so we're now allowed to play football. 50 years, we were not allowed. So things have changed in a such a good way. So I believe women getting very, very important in this society to address these uh, problems. Brilliant. And just to go back, I suppose, Rafa, you, I think you put it so beautifully about, you know, football reaching the heart. You know, football has this power. It has this potential to unlock and reach millions and really kind of normalize sustainability and bring it to the fore and allow communities together to kind of rise up, show that they care about this, which in turn, in our position, we think shows to the leaders, et cetera, that we can, we can bring about this change at a systemic level. But we're yet to really unlock that, that, that bigger piece, right? And so I suppose, what do we think is needed to make that happen. Guy, perhaps I can put this to you first. You're kind of, you sit back, you see lots of clubs. What do you think is that missing piece that we still need to kind of really unlock to, you know, is it just regulation, but is it more about the inspiration, the creativity? Is it about the football, footballers themselves actually now? Leadership? Um, well, leadership, of course, is a key factor. If you, any, any club or any company in general that is already very good at sustainability 90% of the time is because there was a CEO or a owner that really believe in it. So that's a key element. But of course, not everybody is really into it. Regulation, of course, is key. I think there is another big issue at the moment, which of course is going to be um, solved in a few years. There is a lack of professionals in it. That's yeah. a really huge problem. Um, especially in certain, maybe not in the UK, but um, 
we represent 55 countries, so in East Europe, for instance, the Balkans. I have clubs that ask me. I, I, I'm also open to, to pay and to have a consult. I don't find a good consultant for me because there is really a lack of knowledge, um, especially applied to the sport industry, because maybe you have it if you are in oil and gas or in traditional manufacturing sector. But sustainability in sport is quite different. Um, so there's, there's quite a problem on this. Um, and that's what we try to, to solve in a way of producing some supporting materials, be it webinars, be it presentation or, or guide, guidance that anyone can access. Um, and then I think very peculiar to football as a sector is that it's a very quick business. Um, clubs' strategy is to win the game. That's it. If you ask a club, what is your vision for the next three years, five years? I have no clue. It's a, it's a sport where you, I mean, it's a club that very often they change the top management so often that it's very difficult. No, you're here today. You, will you be here next year? Who knows? Of course, your, your time horizon is very short. And sustainability, unfortunately, is something that requires careful planning. It's not something you can reach in a few months, something you need to go step by step. So that doesn't help um, to integrate it into the overall business strategy if you don't have strategy for the company, <laughs> honestly, right? Yeah, so that, that short-term, I'm not even by their own, the short-term sort of effect that happens within clubs doesn't allow for the longer-term planning around sustainability, yeah. plus the lack of professionals. Rafa, do you think that or...? Yeah, of course. That the, for us, we focus all our the strategy in this case uh, environmental or for green as a long term one. It's crucial to think uh, widely in terms of time. O otherwise, uh, you cannot. Uh, as we are trying, for me, one of the key uh, uh, elements that we we have, and that I think could be the piece that is missing, is that uh, we need to all the, all the clubs need not not to be afraid of. Uh, failing in, in any of the actions, any of the, of the, they, they, they all need to be brave. I think we are doing it. We are being innovative. We are learning from, from trying things, but acting. We need to, to act. We need to do things. We need to uh, avoid uh, paralysis because of the analysis. Uh, <laughs> we need to, to, to focus on action and it's easy to, 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 to start doing something. It is crucial for me also the decision takers to, to, to support these actions and these strategies. Otherwise, I understand it's difficult in, in other clubs. So from my point of view, it's crucial to, to focus all the awareness raising also in top managers. Uh, it's really important from my point of view. We are very lucky because Again, our board of directors, they really believe that this is important and, do, and that we need to do it, uh, but it's not the reality of every club, unfortunately. So I think those two things are, are really important to, to fill the gap. I think the same, Rishi. I mean, you've obviously got the board of directors, I think, brought in in, in, mm -hmm. in Liverpool. What about, what about the footballers themselves? Do you think there's still, that's another bit to unlock to really kind of see this you know, sustainability normalize, take hold, and really inspire fans that sort yeah, of... I think, I think that's fair. I think if you look at sustainability holistically, then I think footballers across the whole of the game have been really strong in community, um, and rightly so. I think for the next step, I think, for the game generally is how do you get people to talk to some of the, the trickier topics, i.e. environmental sustainability. Um, one thing that we do at Liverpool is that we actually work directly with our players, and we ask them, like, what's important to you? And that allows us to use their words and work with them to deliver something that's authentic. The, the last thing that you want is a piece of content, and we've all seen them with, a, with the player who's reading off a board or an autocue, and it's really wooden and forced, and you're just like, well, like, we've seen it and we laugh because we've probably all done it at some <laughs> point as well in respective campaigns that we've worked on. Um, so for us, it's about building that relationship with them. To Rafa's point, it's about getting all individuals, not necessarily just players, into a comfort zone. With the red way, it's, we flip the narrative on the red way. We actually 
went out the very, very, like for the first time, probably only time, and said, this is what we want to achieve. And an element of risk comes with that. Sports teams, football teams, everyone, very good at launching a program, waiting three years and go, look at what we did. It's brilliant. Let's pat ourselves on the back. And you don't talk about the ups and the downs and the challenges and the setbacks. You just say, look at what we achieve. Where we've tried to be, well, we have really worked hard to do that differently. And sometimes that comes with elements of criticism. But you have to accept that. But then also it comes with a lot of praise. And I think having that transparent approach allows you to have really deep and meaningful conversations with people people who can come in and help you solve your problems, but also with other clubs, with colleagues like Gaia, like Rafa, say to them, like, this is our problem, can you help us? It's not a competitive edge, it's actually, actually, problems tend to be the same, so yeah. Yeah, I think we find that in a lot of industries, actually, behind yeah. the scenes, competitors at the front, and behind the scenes when it comes to sustainability initiatives, because yeah. they're all quite new, everyone's quite willing to work together and put mm. competitiveness aside when it comes to actually mm. sharing best practice, so. Uh, Monica, I mean, the future is female. Do you think that that is the key to unlocking this at scale? <laughs> well, we need men and women. We are together in this planet, and we have to make sure we're all working on that. And uh, I'd like to address what's happening in Saudi Arabia. It, uh, they have a vision, they have a mission, not only to win the World Cup, which everybody likes to uh, participate. They have a, a vision which is called 2030 and uh, I know we're running almost out of time and everybody has to say something. So if you have time to read that, this is really interesting how Saudi Arabia now changing their mindset. Uh, they want to plant, believe it or not, 600, trees, 600 million trees by 2030. And they're really looking at all of these topics which uh, it's, I don't want to say them all because it's too many that they're really serious about it. And of course, they're a bit now for the World Cup 2034, for the Men's World Cup, as everybody knows. And I believe the criteria FIFA is setting, that they really want to fulfill everything, you know, having uh, the stadium, how they built that. And uh, they have a new city called Neom, so just Google that city. They want to make it net zero carbon. I think this is something they want to do after they're having the oil and the gas spent for many years, but they're really serious. So I really like this, that in football, that this can really happen, and uh, in Saudi Arabia, it will happen. Brilliant. We've got a couple of minutes left, and I think sustainability can be quite a heavy topic, and one that we can all feel a bit, oh, can we just not talk about it and talk about <laughs> something else? I feel that daily, and I work in this industry. So I'd like to finish by asking each of you, actually, what gives you hope? What makes you feel actually quite comforted and excited for a, for a future where we actually do see football sustainability? It's normalized. We don't have to actually have these types of discussions anymore because it's just part and parcel. So perhaps I'll start with you, Rishi. What gives you yeah. hope? So two very quick things I would say. I think most, if not all, football clubs are now doing something around environmental sustainability. That's incredibly encouraging. Even two, three years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. Um, and then the second part of that is the openness of colleagues in those roles, colleagues across different football clubs, as you say. The competitive edge is very much on the pitch, and we recognize that, but people are willing and open to having these conversations with each other and learn, and people are very open around what's working, but really importantly, and most importantly, what's not working so well. Rafa? Well, my main conclusion is like, um, it's uh, crucial to be to to really know about the reality, to to find that motivation, to to keep on having this conversation. You, we need to, even to study. We need to share knowledge, other experience with those who are involved in in the topics we are working, and and to know more about them will make us be more passionate about uh, working on them. So I try to find that, uh, that knowledge, that experience. We, we, we try to do it through action. And each time we want to, 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 to be better, to increase uh, our action and to decrease our impact in terms of environmental. So yeah, uh, we, we, we need to keep on working and keep on sharing. Brilliant. Gaia? I think my desire would be that sustainability becomes Absolutely normal function like any other with finance or legal and that we are not the freak ones or the Taliban one. Yesterday someone told me and Rafa we are the Taliban ones. <laughs> um, 
I mean, yeah, that it becomes just a normal function in any company as any other, and that we have a clear mission and role to play. That's it. Monica, in a word. Just one certain thing. I think the new generation, it's called Z generation, <laughs> they are caring. And I think that makes me positive that our next, next generation are taking all of these uh, things we have said and that it will be hopefully a better world or greener world in future. Brilliant. Thank you so much for Thank joining. You. Thank you all for being here today.